start off by taking this opportunity to thank our sponsors for today's shiur. Parashat HaShavua, Parashat B'Shalach. Our shiur is sponsored, number one, by Annie and Joel Tenser. This is to commemorate the yard site of Annie's father, Menachem Mendel, Ben Avram Yaakov, Zichrona Livracha. So we thank you very much for the sponsorship. And may the words of Torah be a schus for the neshama. We also would like to thank uh, Eva Perez, who's sponsoring to commemorate the yard site of her mother, Miriam Bat Eliezer Yisrael, Zichrona Livracha. So thank you for the sponsorship. And may the words of Torah be a schus, a merit for the neshama. I'd like to thank our third sponsor, that's uh, Chana Binenstock, who's sponsoring to commemorate the yard site of her husband, our dear friend, uh, Reb Zev Binenstock, Aaron Zev Ben Yosef. Uh, it was a great schus to have a very close connection to him, and we remember him, and we miss him, and may the neshama benefit from our words of Torah today. So thank you. And thank you all for joining us. If you do have a chumash, that is good. We are going to study today the beginning of our long journey, a journey that was supposed to be short and took 40 years. Uh, what's always fascinating, and I think probably every year we focus at least a few minutes on the introduction to the departure from Egypt. We finally leave. And God Almighty, you got to admit, put on an incredible show that our expectation would obviously be that as our ancestors depart from Egypt, they understand God gets the credit for it. But there was a problem. And the problem is that the chinuch, the education, uh, the school system, the public school system in Egypt was such that the culture was based on everything you have comes from Pharaoh. Dubista Gornish, you're nothing without Pharaoh. And the result was that the average Jewish person, even after seeing and experiencing these 10 plagues, still believed that anything we do get is due to Pharaoh. And the Torah indicates that vayhi b'shalach paro et ha'am. In other words, if you would approach the am, the simple Jews, not the ones that developed an understanding, not the tribe of Levi. If you're a Levi, you could be very proud of your ancestors because we are not talking about them. Your ancestors, my friends, the Levim, they understood very well. And if the Torah would be referring to them, it would have been vayhi b'shalach ha'kadosh baruch or vayhi Behotzi, and it was as God Almighty took the Jews out of Egypt, but that's not the case. There was an Am, a simple group, and they still gave credit to Pharaoh. There's a general rule in Chumash that when you see the term Am, and it does not say B'nai Israel, and it does not say Am Hashem, but just Am, there's a problem here. Because when Jews view themselves as a nation and that they have an identity without God, that leads to trouble. And therefore, the Torah is basically telling us, guess what? Yes, they left, but it was easier to take the Jew out of Egypt than Egypt out of the Jew. And based on that, uh, there's a fascinating insight of the Chatam Sofer, on the second half of the verse. The second half of the first verse is that you should know geographically, it would have made sense to lead a nation from Egypt to the promised land. It would have made sense that they travel by the coast and make the way to Israel through the land of the Philistines. That would have been an easy access, but the verse tells us, Velo Nacham Elohim, God Almighty did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. Ki karovhu, in other words, and the reason you would think that that would be the ideal path is because it is near. That's one way of reading it. 
Or another way of reading those words, kikarovu, due to the fact that it is close to Egypt, what is going to happen if in during that journey, they're going to face some challenge. If you have a nation that still has this deep emotional attachment to the land of Egypt, if you see any challenge, what happens? You go home. So therefore, God Almighty did not want to take them through the easy, straight path where they would have the ability to return, and it is karov. Ki amara lokim, God was concerned, peni ma'am, the nation might regret the fact that it left. Birotam milchama, when they are going to experience battles and wars. Vishavu mitzrayma. So this is the simple reading of the verse. Comes the Khatam Sofer, and he shares with us, and we've expanded on this in the past. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go th- a, a brief reminder of this insight. Khatam Sofer tells us that logically, if you have a group of people that are barbaric, and he uses this word, barbaric, and you want to educate them, and you want to turn them into people who connect to the higher being, who live a life of meaning and value and inspire the world, logically you would go and work in stages. In other words, first you take this barbaric group and you teach them how to use a fork and a knife, and you teach them how to act in a decent way. You teach them derech eretz, the way of the world, the way of the land. After, right, you've transformed them and they have values and they have some level of ethics and they understand that in a society, you cannot allow one person to do something that if everyone does, society will collapse. Once you've educated them, then you can move on and upgrade them, inspire them, experience a revelation, and you can have a nation that is worthy of teaching Torah. In other words, logically, you would work in stages. Comes the Khatam Sofer, and the Khatam Sofer tells us that you should know, Lo nacham elokim plishtim. The path to Sinai, God Almighty made the decision that the appropriate way of reaching it is not through the derech eretz of the Philistines. You know that the Philistines were ethical people? Do you know that when Abraham had an issue with Pharaoh, Pharaoh tells him, get out of here. You know, you can't stay in this nation. This nation, the Egyptians were lacking values completely. The Philistines, on the other hand, were educated, according we've discussed in the past, that they had origins in Greek culture. So therefore, the Philistines were presented a, le- a nation that had derech eretz. They interacted well. They had decency. So the Torah is telling us that Kodesh Baruch Hu chose a path that was not the gradual path. It was not from a barbaric group to derech eretz like the Philistim and then Sinai, because God felt that that's not going to work. Because if you have ethics, but you are lacking the fear of God, and you have the war with your evil inclination, you're going to collapse. The Jew, by just relying on ethics, right, on rational ethics, on decency, you're not going to achieve your mission. It's not going to work. Because when the evil inclination shows up, when a society is only based on ethics that are rational, when the challenge comes, when the evil inclination comes, when a society feels, you know what, it's too much of a burden to deal uh, with older people, it's too much of a burden to invest uh, in, in hospitals and palliative care, uh, so we're going to go ahead and legislate ways of uh, you know, ending life. When a society does not understand that there's a divine being and that there's a spirit of God in every person, and that every breath that a human being takes has value, all that, by the way, was taught to us at Sinai. If we only rely on Derech Eretz, and then you have a milchemet ha-yetzer, a battle with the evil inclination, you're going to collapse. You're going to return to Egypt. To, you'll be barbaric again, a society, right? They could have the greatest philosophers, 
Uh, they could appear to be a society of value and decency that very much inspires and impresses us. But you should know when the evil inclination comes in, they'll turn barbaric. That's what the Khatam Sofer tells us. And that's how he reads the second half of the verse. God Almighty did not lead them through a path or the gradual approach. There are chelerets plishtin that is too close, that is too close to Egypt. Because when there is a war, milchemet hayets, or a war with the evil inclination, you'll become barbaric again. And unfortunately, we have experienced in history that you could have a nation where that created uh, the greatest art and the greatest music and ethics and values and departments of philosophy, uh, but send people to gas chambers because derech eretz without Torah, derech eretz without understanding that there is a divine spirit in every human returns us to an Egypt culture. That is what Khatam Sofer tells us. In verse number 19, the Torah tells us what Moshe takes with us, takes with him personally from Egypt. In verse 19, Vaikach Moshe, what did Moshe take? Et atzmot Yosef imo, he took the remains of Yosef. Ki, due to the fact, Hashbea hishbia, Yosef himself turned to the Israelites and made them take an oath that they commit the next generation to take an oath that when God Almighty will free you from this land, please take with you my remains. Okay, so it's a verse we are familiar with. And <clears throat> we've, again, <clears throat> briefly, because we talked about this in the past, you know that for us Jews, there's a concept of sanctity. And there are many laws of sanctity. And we're familiar with the fact that if a person, for example, is impure, uh, he would not enter the temple. And in, in the past, we've addressed the fact that there are like rings. In other words, there is the most sanctified area. Then there's area number two. And then there's area number three. And every single one of those areas, and you have to Im imagine them as three rings where you have the core, the one around the core, and then the external one, every single one of them has a lower level, meaning the core has the highest level of sanctity. And as you move outward, it lowers the touch. The core, the inner circle, we call it machane shechina. And in the wilderness, for example, it is where the mishkan was. When the temple was bent, built, uh, in Yerushalayim, that was obviously the area of the temple itself. Then you have a circle around it called Machane Levia, right? The camp of the Levites, where in the wilderness the Levites lived there. And when they built a temple, it was the whole Temple Mount, area that was larger than the temple itself. And then you have the area of Machane Israel, the camp of the Israelites which in the wilderness was the whole camp. And when they eventually settled in Yerushalayim, it's the city of Yerushalayim. And there are laws. For example, a person who is a mitzora, a person who develops leprosy. And uh, we know that tradition teaches us that this was a spiritual ailment that was the byproduct of a person who only saw negative by others and shared it with others. And this is a person that is quite destructive for a society. We can't live with people that only see the negative and share negative. They, you destroy, such people basically destroy societies. And obviously we wanna focus on the good, people who see the good in others and share good about others and are always positive. They are the greatest people in our society. And Baruch Hashem, we have such people, right? They see the good, they share the good, they're positive. They come into a room, there are positive vibes. That's how you build community. So the Torah is teaching you that lesson that they have no place in Machane Israel. So the Mitzorah is sent out of all camps, even the most external one. Now, if a person, for example, has an impurity uh, that relates to a sexual matter, it's known as the Zav. So he could be in the camp of Israel. In other words, someone that gives into temptation at times, 
We don't exclude them, right? They're humans. Everyone has their moments that they fail. However, in the camp of the Levites, in the camp of the Levites, they can't stay there. Why is it? The Levites are educators. They're teachers. They're here to teach you right from wrong. When a person is simply controlled by desire, such things corrupt the mind. You cannot provide clarity if the one controlling you is not what you've studied and what you've learned, but rather what you desire. Due to the corruption that is the byproduct of desire, the Levite, the Levite, or in his camp, you cannot have the Zav. You send them out of the inner camp. Now, if a person is a Tmemet, if a person came in contact with a corpse, and we know that according to our tradition, there's a level of impurity that's, that is placed or sticks to him, and it needs to be purged with the uh, service of the red heifer. If a person is a Tmemet, impure, due to the contact with the corpse, he cannot be in the Machane Shechina, he cannot be in the inner core, in the holiest of all areas, he cannot be. He could be, he could be with the Levi'im. There is nothing wrong for the Levi, and there is nothing wrong for when it comes to the camp of the Levi, or there's nothing wrong in the area of the temple mount, not in the structure itself of the temple, to have the Tmemet. This information is, is, is actually derived from the fact that the Torah tells us Vaikach Moshe, Moshe was a Levi. Moshe lived in the camp of the Levim. Vaikach Moshe Imo, with him. Imo, the rabbi tell us that he kept it actually with him, perhaps even in his tent. He took the remains of Yosef. The issue of impurity, no problem because he was in the camp of the Levites. This information is derived from here. And there's a very important lesson here. You know, Judaism has a lot of lessons. However, we have to remember that there is a core lesson of Judaism. The core lesson of Judaism cannot and should not be all about olam haba and death. It's a, it's a problem. In other words, yes, we believe that there's an afterlife. And we do believe that there's reward in the world to come. But we have to remain a religion of life, a religion that values life, a religion that understands that there's magnificence in the world and we can achieve things when we live, and to be full of life. The core of Judaism cannot have any death in it. In the Machanesh Shechina, in the holiest of all areas, that inner circle, which is the core of all Jewish messages, you cannot have someone that's been contaminated by the death. Now, for the Levi, on the other hand, the Levi is not the core. The Levi is the educator. And as you are an educator, sometimes you'll bring lessons from different uh, occurrences, different life cycles, or different experiences as a lesson, death does have a lesson. In other words, when you're you see that a person departs this world, you know, there's a lesson there you could remember to appreciate what you have or to do whatever the lesson is. So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, the teacher, the one that is providing lessons, that's not the core, he could have Yosef with him because it plays a role in a lesson. And there's a very specific lesson here. You know that there are many magazines or now online uh, articles you could read uh, that relate to, to Jews in North America. There's a, there's a great interest. There's a great uh, interest in Jews and their history in North America. This is not something that's new. In other words, you read like in the United States, there's a lot about someone by the name of Haim Solomon, Chaim Solomon. He was a Polish Shayid, landed up in the United States, got involved in finance, and he basically fi uh, financed the, 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 the Americans during the, during the 1776 uh, War of Independence, and he's a big, a big hero. Uh, the the non-Jews perhaps are not very familiar with him, but Jews, of course, know about him. 
uh, there are, you know, when it comes to Jews in sports, right? So every Jewish kid knows and heard about Sandy Koufax. So can't, Sandy Koufax does get credit uh, for not pitching on Yom Kippur. No, no doubt there's a merit there. Uh, but there's always a fascination. And at times, it is the Jew wanting to convince others, or at least convince themselves, that you know what, we are part of this current culture. We built this country as well. You know, America should realize what a contribution uh, we made. Do you know how many uh, Xmas songs would not be in existence if not for the Jewish people? Do you know what a contribution we made? I mean, what would America music be without Rhapsody in Blue? You know, without Gershwin, without Warner Brothers, right? Uh, uh, without Mayor Lansky and without... Um, Bugsy Siegel and others, we made such contributions to American culture. We are part of this culture. We are Americans, right? And therefore in the United States, you could see a group of Hasidic Jews singing uh, the national anthem, right? God bless America. You could meet, meet Payas, you could sing it because we are part of this culture. So that's perhaps okay to an extent. But when suddenly you think that your whole identity is the host country, we have a problem. Because the Jew must remember that it's a host country. We are connected to a different land. We're very grateful. We're always grateful. We're very machmer in that halacha of being grateful to our host country. But we have to remember our identity. Now, the Jews in Egypt had a problem. They viewed themselves as Egyptians. And for the Jew, the Jew, whenever he would enter into a conversation with his Gentile neighbor, and the Gentile neighbor would indicate, you know, you really don't belong here. You know, you're an outsider. The Jew would respond, what do you mean? Have you heard of Yosef? And the Gentile perhaps would say, I don't know, um, rings a bell, I don't know. And the Jew would go crazy. What do you mean you haven't heard, heard of Yosef? He's the man that saved this country during a very challenging period of time. And I have no doubt that in many academic journals in Egypt during that period of time as the Jews were there, Jews were writing articles about Yosef, that Gentiles should know, that the nation should know, Egyptians should know about our contribution. And we are part of this country, Yosef, Yosef. And now when it's time to leave and you have people who feel that deep attachment to Egypt and its culture, Moshe Rabbeinu has to teach a lesson. And the lesson is, Guess what? Yosef is leaving Egypt. And he himself, the last words he uttered to his family was that one day we're going to leave this country. This is not our home. Hashbeah Hishbia. By taking and by the nation seeing that their leader, what did the leader take with him? Right? There's always, a, it's interesting always to look what leaders carry. And, and, and it's very symbolic. Whenever you look in the United States, uh, presidents uh, walking uh, to the to Air Marine One or Air Force One, they don't carry anything, right? It's a, uh, it's it, unless you know. I'm, I'm sure uh, Milania was carrying a very, very expensive uh, a, a purse. But that aside, in general, the presidents don't carry anything. But there was a time in the 1987, 1988 when there were rumors that Reagan already is not fully functioning. Uh, so to indicate that he was more busy, he started carrying a briefcase. In other words, to show that he is busy, a briefcase, and obviously the briefcase had briefs and information, right? probably nothing there, or maybe some comic books or uh, some old reels from his acting career. But the, the point is that what a leader carries symbolizes something. What is Moshe Rabbeinu taking? People wonder, what's he carrying? What's Shlepta? The, Yosef, the remains of Yosef, because Yosef was not part of Egypt. He wanted out. We don't belong here. The Am needed to learn that lesson. That's why, Now, this is a Parsha that has a lot. Obviously, we're familiar with the Shira. And obviously, we have the story of the Man. And we'll share something brief that relates to the Man. You know, they needed to be sustained in the wilderness. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu provided them lechem min ha bread that came 
from heaven. Now, what happened was, uh, this is in uh, chapter 16, where on Friday, this is verse 22, there's a shock, something very shocking to the people of Israel, that they got used to man falling during the week, and the amount they collect was very, very specific. But on Friday, they go out, they collect, they come home, they measure it, and it's double. And they didn't know why. They had no information, nothing to indicate to them that the Friday gathering is going to be different. So the leaders come to Moshe, and Moshe says, Oh, right, you're right. And this is in verse 23. Moshe tells the leader, Hu asher diber Hashem. Oh, yeah, that's what God said. That you should know Friday is the day we prepare for Shabbos. Shabbat Shab- Shabbaton Kodesh Lashem Machar. So therefore, everything has to be prepared today. Now, it appears that God was not so happy with Moshe that he didn't share this information earlier. In other words, it was only after they discover the double uh, portion that Moshe provides the information. And therefore, in verse 28, Why did you, you, you refuse to observe what I teach? Why did you not give over that information? And only after they saw the double portion of the mana do you tell them about Shabbat. You should have told them about Shabbat earlier. You should have informed them that on Friday you prepare more because you need to be all ready for Shabbat. So how do we defend Moshe? This is a question that commentators deal with. So the Rashbam shares with us something very, very interesting. I'll just uh, share this briefly before we move on to the main uh, discussion we're going to have today. Rashbam tells us the following. You know, when we want to become better Torah Jews, there are times that we could be inspired by things, right? You get inspired, some you, you interact with a person who's very righteous or you experience something and you are inspired. There are times that the way you achieve things is by preparation. And what do we mean by that? You know, in two months from now, we're gonna be preparing for the Seder night. Now, Preparation for the Seder night we are all familiar with. What's always fascinating to me is how kids are prepared for the Seder night from a very young age. uh, The children learn already in school everything about the Seder. And the three-year-old, the four-year-old knows all the makos and knows exactly what is going to be taking place on the Seder night. And as they get older, they come home with booklets upon booklets of Divrei Torah, and it becomes unfortunate or fortunately impossible to sit through the Seder because every minute they have to share something they heard from their teacher from some Hasidic vart about a specific word taken out of, taken out of context in the Haggadah. It is an, a difficult experience sometimes, the Haggadah. And the truth is that's not the way it should be because the Torah tells us it is something we're supposed to be talking and sharing. And the kids don't keep quiet because teachers taught them everything. And even more than that, you know, really, in its ideal form, the Seder night is supposed to be a night where the child is shocked. In other words, in its ideal form, the child, the three-year-old, is not supposed to know anything is going to be different that night. He's supposed to come to the table the Seder night and expect it to be a nice festive meal. No, not too different than a Shabbat. Maybe not too different than a family gathering. And then suddenly when they uncover the chalas, he sees matzah. And suddenly he sees that they have all kinds of different dips and bitter herbs and cups of wine. And he has no understanding what is going on here. There's supposed to be a shock. That shock, that surprise has a major impact. Right When anything surprises us. Uh, psychologically, mentally, it has the deepest impact. You know that if you analyze your dreams, often, if you are able to remember your dreams, it is going to be those things that during the day you weren't expecting. In other words, if let's say, uh, you know, during the day, 
uh, you're walking and, and suddenly uh, a, a rabbit jumps out of the bushes right in front of you, that will be making its appearance in your dream simply because that had a very deep impact on your mind. That's what we're trying to do on the Seder night to surprise them. We don't do it because they know everything. According to Rashba, Moshe Rabbeinu is informed by God, listen, Shabbos is going to be a day. They're not going to prepare anything, but don't worry. They'll get extra man on Friday. So Moshe is thinking to himself, wait a second. I have an idea. I'm not going to tell them anything about Shabbat. And then suddenly on Friday, they're going to go collect the man as they were doing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and realize that as they measure it, they have a double portion. They're going to be shocked. That shock is going to have an impact. And then they're going to go ahead and deeply appreciate what Shabbat is about. Moshe wanted to make Shabbat for them like the Seder night is supposed to be. That's why he didn't tell them. But God disagreed. God felt, you know what, true, there are things that you teach by the impact, by the special effects, by the surprise. But there are things that require preparation. You know, like in, in Yeshiva, when uh, the Rosh Yeshiva would give his shir twice a week. So the shir would be at noon. So at 9, 9.30 a.m., there would be what we call the tzetel, a little note on the bulletin board that would share the sources that are going to be used for the shiur, for the lecture. So it could be a rashba out in a different area of Talmud or Ritva. And what the expectation was that the students spend the next two and a half hours analyzing in depth those sections. And then we could come prepared to the lecture and deeply appreciate the insight of the Rosh Shiva. There are things that you achieve by preparation. Shabbos is one of them. Shabbos, we have to prepare. We prepare, number one, by every single day when it comes to the song of the day, Hayom, Yom Rishon B'Shabbat, Yom Shani B'Shabbat. We're preparing. We prepare by going to the marketplace. You see something good in the marketplace and it's going to last until Shabbat, right? You see this good a jar of herring and you really say to yourself, this is an enjoyable one. You buy it Monday already for Shabbat. It is a day that God wants us to prepare for. And so too, by the way, when it comes to the spiritual messages of Shabbat, we study the laws of Shabbat to be able to really maximize that day, not just by sitting down at the Shabbos meal or Shabbos afternoon with those halachot, but throughout the week, it is a day that needs preparation. And that's what God says to Moshe. Moshe, very nice. You wanted to surprise them. You didn't tell them about it and you wanted them to be shocked and you wanted that impact. Shabbat needs Preparation. That was the message that was given to him. But now I want to go to the last, the last uh, verses, last nine verses of the parasha that talks about the arrival of Amalek. Amalek. Vayavo Amalek. So that's what we're going to be studying now. These nine verses, by the way, we read on Purim. And as we're going to get closer on Purim when we are going to read this here in Shul. God willing, there's going to be a zoom of these nine verses, and that's how we're going to fulfill Parsha Zachar. Obviously, more to discuss. This is just a little bit of our preparation for it. But let's let's analyze what's happen, happening here. Vayavo Amalek. Amalek arrives. And they attack Israel in a place called Refidim. Refidim relates to the word ra, something loose. There's something loose here that's taking place. Now, Moshe, by the way, could, could fight. Just for the record, Moshe is a good general too. If you look later in uh, Bamidbar, Moshe is a general too. But here, for whatever reason, he's not leading the battle, but he calls Yehoshua. And he tells Yehoshua, Bechar, choose Anashim. You got to choose people to go out and fight Amalek. What's Moshe going to be doing as Yehoshua is in the battlefield? I'm going to be standing on the top of a hill, and that's where I'm going to be during the war. Now, what's very interesting, and this is what we're going to have to analyze, Moshe tells Yehoshua that you should know I'm going to be at, on the top of the hill, 
but I will have with me the staff of God. Umate ha'elokim biyadi. Meaning, you're sure, don't worry. You're going to be fighting, but I'm, I'm going to be praying, obviously. That's what Moshe does. But you know what I'm going to have in my hand? Matea Elokim Biadi. And when you read it, the first thing that comes to mind that this is some kind of a charm like. In other words, you know what, Yeshua? This is what I'm going to have in my hand. What, what, what's, what's it all about? In other words, in what way is that supposed to calm Yeshua down? I'm going to have my staff of God in my hand. So, in a few weeks from now, in a month from now, uh, we're going to be celebrating Purim, Bezrat Hashem. And we have gone through now, it's going to be a year, at that point, it's going to be a year in the Jewish calendar of us uh, dealing with this very, very serious pandemic. And there's a whole level of challenges, of tragedy. I am not, it's, 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 a, it's, not, it's not a very good time, I think we all agree. And we have a lot to pray for. And we also, as Jews, have to deal with our cycle. Like I remember, not, you know, 10 months ago, talking about how are we going to do Mechirat Chametz? How is Shavuot going to look like? How is Tisha B'Av going to look like? Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur going to look like? And we've gone through it. And I give a lot of credit, like especially when it comes to the Yamim Noraim, a lot of people put a lot of time and effort to getting it right. And thank God. And now we are completing the cycle. We are completing the cycle with Chagim, not being able to be in Shul with this Purim. Last Purim, it was something theoretical. It was a few days later that it really hit us, what we're dealing with. Now, Purim is going to create a challenge, and obviously there's going to be discussion and classes. How do we fulfill Megillat Esther when we can't be in a shul, either due to the province or due to help for whatever reason, we can't come to shul. How are we going to do it? So Bezrat Hashem, there's going to be a class, and we're going to be discussing it. But there's a lot of halachic literature about it. A lot of halachic literature about listening to a Megillah from a distance. Because that's what some people will be doing, by the way. Listening to Megillat, Esther, from a distance. And we have, we have the technology to do it. And when several of the authorities address this issue of, you know, like responding or hearing or fulfilling your obligation from a distance, they can't turn to Talmudic sources because as Talmudic sources, they did not have the radio where there is responsa, 20th century responsa about Megillat Esther over the radio. They did not have the telephone. They did not have Zoom. So the Talmudic scholar who always tries to find information in Talmudic sources uh, uh, to guide us halachically is in trouble, right? But there is one area in the Talmud where it talks about fulfilling an obligation from a distance. What is that discussion? Now, the Talmud in Sukkah shares with us that during the second temple period, there was a very large and significant Jewish community in Egypt, in Mitzrayim. We always talk about during the second temple period, Jews in Babylonia, but there was a very strong Jewish presence in Egypt. Now, the Talmud tells us that you should know that in Egypt, they had a gigantic synagogue, gigantic synagogue. We don't know the exact numbers. The Talmud provides a number, but it could be an exact